Okay, we are live. Hopefully people can see the presentation, or see me at least, and hear what we're talking about. I will uh, wait and make sure people are joining and also making sure that you can hear me. Just give me one second. So if you can hear me, please let me know, and we will go ahead and start up. Okay, great. So it sounds like you can hear what's going on. So welcome to the first virtual office hours, which is actually sort of the second live lecture plus virtual office hours. What we're gonna do today is we're going to first talk about Java semaphores, and then we're gonna talk about the programming assignment number one, which is available on the uh, GitHub release in the repository that's for this particular MOOC and this particular offering of the MOOC. As always, if you have any questions, please go ahead and type them into the QA. Uh, portion of the interface, and I will address them during breaks in the videos. So without further ado, let's go ahead and see if we can start up with the material. All right, let me go ahead and share my screen so you can see what I'm doing. Okay. So you should see the slides here for Java semaphores. So today we're gonna to talk about Java semaphores and we're going to talk about the structure and functionality of the semaphores and show some examples of how they can be applied in practice. So the first thing that we'll talk about is explain how Java semaphores can enable multiple threads to do a couple of different things. Number one, mediate access to a limited number of shared resources. That's one way they're used. And another way they're used is to coordinate the order in which operations occur. So a semaphore can be viewed as a mechanism for atomically incrementing and decrementing an integer count to control access to a shared resource. The terminology itself came from signaling mechanisms that were used for ships and railroads and so on. And in particular, semaphores are used to control access to a shared railroad track. So if you uh, live in countries that have railroads that are widely used, you know that it's sometimes necessary to single track the trains for various reasons. And semaphores are used in order to control access to that track by multiple trains so they don't interfere with each other. In the software world, we use semaphores to control access and mediate the interactions between multiple threads. So for example, you might have a, uh, a resource pool where you wanted to ga gauge or provide access to a limited number of threads, even though there might actually be multiple threads that are able to run. So you might say, we'll give a semaphore with a count of two, and we'll have a whole pool of threads try to access whatever resource is protected by the semaphore. And as long as the count is greater than zero, then a thread can acquire a semaphore and, and do its thing. But when the count drops to zero, then any other threads are gonna have to wait. They're gonna be blocked. And we'll see some examples of this shortly. There are a couple of different types of semaphores. There's so-called counting semaphores, which have a number of states that are defined by a counter variable. Uh, sometimes these, these states are referred to as permits. And this counter variable has a precise meaning. So if the count of states or the permits is negative, then that many threads are queued waiting to acquire the semaphore. If the count is zero, that means there's no waiting threads and an acquire operation would be put in the queue and blocked until the counter of the permits or states is positive. And finally, if the value of the semaphore is positive, then there are no waiting threads and an acquire operation will not block the invoking thread. So those are the three main categories of states for counting semaphores. 
Then there's also something called binary semaphores, which are basically either all or nothing. They have two states only, acquired and not acquired. And that restricts the counter to the values zero or one. Now, it turns out in practice, of course, that you can typically emulate a binary semaphore with a counting semaphore just by constraining its values to be zero or one by convention. We're going to show examples of both counting and binary semaphores in later videos. Uh, one thing we'll take a look at is we'll take a look at this Palantir, Palantir Manager application, which is actually your first programming assignment. We'll talk about that. And then we'll also talk about a concurrent ping pong application, and I'll show you the code for that, which uses semaphores in a slightly different way. So let's take a look at a simple example. So consider some kind of image rendering application that uses a pool of threads to process different parts of the images concurrently on multiple cores. That's what the, the apples here are. These are cores. That's the intent of the image there. So we're going to configure the application to restrict the number of threads that could run concurrently on the processor cores to avoid taking all the cores on the device for image processing and, and saving a few for other things like email or web browsing or watching videos or whatever. So for, for sake of argument, we'll say that we're only going to allow two cores to uh, enable the rest of the system to be responsive. So even though there are four cores, we're only going to allow two to be used for image processing. So in that case, we would create a semaphore, a counting semaphore with a count of two. And a permit has to be acquired from the semaphore before the thread can run. And so in this case, one thread comes along, it acquires a permit, it gets the semaphore count is decremented by one. Another thread comes along, it acquires a permit, the semaphore count is decremented by one. But any other threads that come along while the count is zero or less need to block until one of the other threads releases the permit. So if another thread releases the permit, then another thread can take it and start to run. This is an example of a so-called fully bracketed model of acquiring and releasing permits to a semaphore. And in a fully bracketed model, the thread that acquires the semaphore is also the thread to release it. There are other models as well where instead of having fully bracketed models, you can have a model where the thread that acquires a semaphore is not the thread to release it. And we'll see an example of that later when we talk about the concurrent ping pong application. There's a number of interesting human known uses of semaphores. My favorite actually came from some experience that I had when I was at the University of California, Irvine as a graduate student. And in those days, we uh, had a situation where we wanted to spend all of our time playing volleyball at the beach. So there would be volleyball courts at the beach. And uh, invariably, there'd always be more people, more teams who wanted to play volleyball than there were courts available to play volleyball. So the way it worked, was that we had a, a bag of beach volleyballs and there was one volleyball for every court that was available. And the protocol was that if a team wanted to play volleyball, it would send somebody to the bag of balls. And if there was a ball available in the bag of balls, then the, the person could retrieve that and then their team could play on one of the courts. If there was no ball in the bag of balls, then the person had to wait until one of the other teams, pair of teams finished and then they would be obliged to return the ball back to the bag. So as long as the number of courts available matched the number of semaphores or, or beach volleyballs in the bag, then we had an easy way of being able to know whether you could play right away or whether you had to wait until there was a court available. So that was basically the way that we used semaphores to play volleyball in, uh, in grad school. Let's take a look at Java semaphores. Java semaphores are a variant of counting semaphores. They have some interesting characteristics we'll talk about shortly. You can read more about them here. They don't actually implement any synchronization related interfaces, unlike other mechanisms in Java synchronizers like uh, Java countdown latches or uh, Java reentrant locks or reentrant read write locks or so on. The uh, semaphores don't implement synchronization related interfaces. Under the hood, they, they apply a pattern from the so-called Gang of Four book, the design pattern catalog, which you can read about on the FAQ, and they apply the pattern called the bridge pattern, which you can read more about here. The bridge pattern essentially decouples an interface from multiple implementations, and it's used in the context of semaphore to allow fair and non-fair 
semantics of the semaphore to be supported by a common interface. And we'll talk more about that in just a minute. Here's how this works. There's a private field called sync, which is an instance of a base class called sync, kind of a funny name. And in the bridge pattern, that plays the role of the implementer hierarchy. And then there's a subclass. The subclass sync is an abstract class that extends a class in Java called abstract queued synchronizer, which you can read about here. The abstract queued synchronizer is a framework that's used by many synchronizers in Java, in Java Util Concurrent. So Rantrant, uh, Rantrant Lock, Rantrant Read Write Lock, Semaphore, Countdown Latch. There's a bunch of things that use abstract queued synchronizer to basically coordinate FIFO access to some count. In this case, it would be the semaphore count. So the sync class is the is the base class or the super class. And then we have a couple of subclasses uh, called fair sync and non-fair sync. And we'll see how those are used in a second. The fair and non-fair sync are used to implement either a fair or non-fair lock acquisition model. So by default, you have by default, this is the default semaphore up here, this one, the one that just has one parameter called permits. By default, the semaphore uses what's called non-fair sync semantics, which means that it's up to the hardware and the virtual machine to pick whichever semaphore will be, uh, whichever thread that's waiting will be released when, uh, and given the chance to acquire a semaphore whenever the semaphore is released. That's non-fair, and it's meant to optimize hardware performance. Then there's also something called uh, fair sync. And if you use this version of the semaphore, the one that takes the fair parameter, then if fair is set to true, then the fair sync semantics will be selected. And fair sync basically allows for the uh, basically FIFO access to the semaphore values by waiting threads. So whichever thread has been waiting the longest will be the one that will be released next when a thread releases the semaphore. So the thread that's been waiting longest will acquire the semaphore when one is released. And th there's a bunch of trade-offs there that we'll talk about uh, in a little bit. The bottom line is that the not fair or non-fair sync semantics are much more efficient from the point of view of releasing the waiting threads quickly, whereas the fair sync semantics are not as efficient, but they give you FIFO ordering, which means you don't have to worry about starvation which is a problem where uh, one thread never gets the semaphore or doesn't get the semaphore for a long time because it's always given to someone else. Turns out that there's other parts of Java synchronizers that use a similar model and use a similar pattern, like the Java reentrant lock, for example, and the Java reentrant read write lock. The constructors create a semaphore with a given number of permits. So you can see here that you can give the permit count and the count is not a maximum, it's just an initial value. So you can actually have the count go above the permit count that's given to the constructor. That's perfectly legal, but it's uh, the original count is just the, the default starting point. And ironically, the, the permit value can actually be negative. You can actually give a, a minus one or a minus two or whatever, some negative number as the permit count. And only until the permit is released that number of times will the waiting threads be able to make progress. And this is typically used to coordinate the order in which, uh, the time at which threads start to run. Let's talk a bit more about some other methods in Semaphore. There's a bunch of methods that are part of the public interface, which includes acquire, acquire uninterruptibly, try acquire, and release. And all these methods simply forward to the implementation or implementer methods that are defined as part of the bridge pattern implementer hierarchy. So here's an example of acquire. Acquire obtains a single permit from the semaphore and it will block until one is available. And under the hood, its implementation calls acquire shared interruptibly with a count of one. And that uses the abstract queued synchronizer framework to, to basically get it one permit. Acquire uninterruptibly does much the same thing, but unlike acquire, uh, acquire uninterruptibly will ignore interrupts. So if an interrupt occurs, then it's simply going to be ignored and it'll continue to block until the interrupt is, until the semaphore is available. 
Try acquire is used to obtain a permit if one is available when you invoke the try acquire method. So it's basically a conditional acquire. If, the, if there's no semaphore available, then it returns false. If there is a semaphore available, it gets it right away. And uh, ironically, the non-timed try acquire doesn't honor the fairness setting. It'll just go ahead and barge in uh, and take the semaphore, even if there's other waiters that are blocked. If you want to have a try acquire that doesn't work that way, you can use the timed try acquire that we'll talk about later. Release returns a permit and it increases the count of the semaphore by one. And you can see again, it just forwards to the underlying abstract queued synchronizer framework to release one semaphore. It's valid for the permit count to exceed the initial permit count. That's not a problem. Moreover, it's also, as I mentioned before, possible for the, the value of a semaphore to be negative initially. And, and all that means is that until someone calls release enough times for the value to become greater than zero, anybody who's trying to acquire the semaphore will have to wait. So that's what a negative value means as the initial value. So it just means that somebody has got to call release enough times to get the value over uh, zero in order for anybody to make forward progress. And again, that's typically used to uh, use for things like test programs to start up a bunch of threads, and then they all wait to acquire the semaphores, and then they go ahead and uh, release them. Okay, so let's go ahead and continue discussing. There's actually a whole pile of other semaphore methods. There's acquire and acquire uninterruptibly, try acquire and release, all of which take different numbers of permits. So you can see here, you can actually block to acquire n permits, like where n is three or five or 10 or whatever the that number is, and you'll only return when all n are available. In contrast, by default, acquire and release, acquire or release a single permit. And then there's also methods that will be timed out. They will do conditional acquisition of semaphores, but they'll only block for a certain amount of time. And if they don't get the semaphore in that amount of time or the number of semaphores they request in that amount of time, then they go ahead and return. So uh, here's a good time to talk about what happens if you need more than one semaphore. So if you call acquire with a count of two and there's only one semaphore available, then acquire will block until there are at least two semaphores available. So that way you can make sure you get both semaphores before you return. Ironically, the timed try acquire methods do honor the fairness setting, so they don't actually barge in. If you call a timed try acquire and there are other semaphores that are waiting and the fairness semantics are set to fair, then you will simply wait at the end of the queue uh, either to get the semaphore or until your timeout period elapses. Now, as we talked about before, the, the, the image processing example I mentioned before was an example where you're going to have acquisition uh, basically doing what's called a fully bracketed protocol. The thread that acquires it is the one that releases it. But there are other situations where acquiring and releasing permits to a semaphore don't have to be fully bracketed. So we'll talk shortly about a ping pong example where the ping and the pong uh, threads take turns printing ping or pong, and they use basically binary semaphores in order to be able to release each other in the proper order. So semaphores can be used to coordinate the order in which things occur. Speaking of which, let's go ahead and talk about this example. So this is the uh, ping pong example. You can go here to this link. Uh, you'll find that all the examples in the slides have a corresponding URL where you can find the code. And so that's where you would go to find it. This is the, uh, the ping pong console example. And uh, you'll see that sometimes the code examples don't appear in the POSA 15 directory. Sometimes they appear other places. And rather than try to copy them around and keep them uh, all in sync, I just give the URL wherever you can find them in my GitHub repositories. So they're always available. They should always be noted on the slides. And all you have to do is just click them when I upload the slides on the PDF. So this particular application is kind of fun. It coordinates thread interactions via Java semaphores. And in this case, the threads alternate printing ping and pong on the console. 
So if things are done properly, when you run the program, it should say ping one, pong one, ping two, pong two, ping three, pong three, and so on. And the, the numbers here are basically the iterations that are taking place. If you don't do this correctly, then it'll say all the pings first, followed by all the pongs, or it'll do them out of order or something. So that would be bad. So we're going to use binary semaphores to make this all work. Here are the various classes in this example. I'll first give you sort of an overview of the design, and then we'll go and take a look at the implementation. So we have a Java class called Play Ping Pong, which is going to have a nested ping pong thread inside of it. And Play Ping Pong has a constructor that takes the number of iterations to run, and it has a run method, so it's going to be its own thread. And you go ahead and run this thing, and the run method here will go ahead and create a couple of ping pong threads. And those ping pong threads will be used in order to actually run the protocol to play ping pong by taking turns, acquiring, and releasing the semaphore. And there's actually two semaphores. There's a first semaphore and a second semaphore. And the threads take turns basically acquiring and releasing the semaphore in order to get the alternating printing behavior that we need here. We also have a couple other things. We have an options class that controls stuff like the number of iterations to run. And we also have a main program that makes an instance of play ping pong. Here's an interaction diagram that illustrates basically how this works. The main program starts to run. And uh, when it's run, it goes ahead and it creates a ping. Uh, a ping pong thread with for the ping object in a ping pong thread instance called pong. So we have ping and pong. Both of these are threads. So we go ahead and create them and start them. And when they start to run, they take turns doing the following. Uh, the ping thread will first acquire the first semaphore. It will then print ping, and it will then release the second semaphore. And the pong thread will block acquiring the second semaphore, and it will print pong, and then it will release the first semaphore. So you'll see that these are going to alternate going back and forth, acquiring and releasing each other's semaphore in order to get the correct alternate behavior. And so the semaphores here are used to coordinate the order in which ping and pong uh, are called. And as we'll see, they, uh, they're going to use basically counting semaphores with a count of zero or one and they're going to take turns doing that. The main thread of control will simply wait to do a barrier synchronization to join on the exiting of the other two threads. So when the other two threads, the ping thread and the pong thread exit, then the main thread will join. And once they're joined, then uh, the program will go ahead and exit. So let's take a look at the code here. Let me go ahead and bring up another uh, slide, and we will take a look at the code. Let's see. Let me go ahead and share my Emacs window. All right. So we go over here to OSA 15 examples, ping pong, and console. So here's the actual code for this program. This is just a simple Java application, it's not an Android application. Um, but we also have Android versions of this code as well, but we'll talk about them later. So here's the main program. As you can see, it's very simple. The main program goes ahead and initializes the options singleton. So you can have command line arguments that will influence how the program runs. It then creates a play ping pong object with the appropriate given number of iterations. And then this ping pong object is passed to a new thread because it's a runnable. And we start that thread, and that will call the run hook method on play ping pong, which is a runnable. So let's go look at play ping pong. Here's class play ping pong. This implements runnable, keeps track of the number of iterations to alternate pinging and ponging. It has a nested static class called ping pong thread. I could have moved this class to its own file, but I just wanted to keep this example simple. Uh, doesn't really matter. In this case, it's fairly concise. So play uh, for so ping pong thread extends thread, and it keeps track of the number of iterations to ping pong. It keeps track of the string, 
whether we're going to ping or pong. And it keeps track of a pair of semaphores, first semaphore and second semaphore. The constructor goes ahead and initializes those fields. And then when acquire is called, it will acquire the first semaphore uninterruptibly. And when release is called, it will release the second semaphore. So notice that it's going to wait on one semaphore and then release the other. And that's how we're going to get the ping pong behavior. Here's the run method. The run method just loops for i equals 1, i less than or equal to max iterations. And every time through the loop, it calls acquire to get a semaphore. It then prints out ping or pong. And then it releases the other semaphore. So that semaphore can run. And then it loops back around again. And it waits to, uh, to acquire its semaphore again. Here's the constructor, it just sets max iterations, and here's the run method of play ping pong. So what this does is it creates a pair of semaphores. The ping semaphore starts out unlocked because it has a count of one, and the pong semaphore starts out locked because it has a count of zero. And so what that means is that the ping thread, when it goes to acquire the semaphore, will find that it's going to be unlocked, so it'll get a chance to go. But when the pong thread goes to acquire its semaphore, it's going to find it's got a value of zero, so it's going to block. Here's how we create those two threads. Here's ping thread, here's pong thread. They both are instances of ping pong thread, where you give the max iterations that you want to loop, you give the string to print, ping or pong, and then you give the ping semaphore first in the case of the ping thread, and the pong semaphore second in the case of the ping thread. And in the case of the pong thread, you give the pong semaphore first, followed by the ping semaphore. And that means that the ping thread always starts. We then go ahead and start both threads. Those threads go off and run. And then the main thread, not the main thread, the, the thread that's running here, the ping play ping pong object thread, will go ahead and wait for both ping and pong threads to exit. So it does joins on both of them. And when it's all done, we print the fact that we're done and we exit. So I encourage you to take a look at this program and see how it works. It's a fun little example of how to use a semaphore. And this particular example, as you can see, does not require full bracketing. It will just go ahead and basically alternate printing ping and pong. All right, so let's go back and finish off our slides and then we'll take some questions. So we're gonna talk now about usage considerations for semaphores. So semaphores are more flexible than some of the other Java synchronizers. In particular, it's more flexible than the synchronized statements that we looked at yesterday in the last class. And it's also more flexible than the Java reentrant lock. And one of the reasons why it's more flexible is because it allows a non-fully bracketed protocol. In other words, one thread acquires, a different thread releases. Whereas the other, synchronization mechanisms we just discussed, synchronized statements and reentrant locks require fully bracketed protocols. So they're only good for certain kinds of serialization concerns. Another thing you can do that's very flexible with Java synchronizers is you can acquire and release multiple permits in a single operation. You don't have to have the acquire and release methods be fully bracketed as we just talked about. However, when you use them to manage access to resource pools, it's going to track the number of free resources, not which resources are actually free. And so uh, that means you have to use some other mechanism, such as a hash map or other semaphores or whatever, in order to be able to figure out which resource is actually available. And we'll see some examples of that a little bit later. Another issue with semaphores is they can be tedious and error prone to program due to common traps and pitfalls with using these low level synchronizers. For example, one common mistake is to acquire a semaphore and then forget to release it. And this sometimes happens if you have exceptions that get thrown inside blocks of code and the exception handlers don't correctly release the resource, the, the semaphore that was acquired. So it's a good idea to get in the habit of using try finally blocks to make sure you always release semaphores or locks even if an exception is thrown. So here's an example where you could actually uh, do this where you use a finally block in order to release the semaphore. But the problem that we see here 
is that we're actually holding the semaphore for a very long period of time. And we might be doing something that doesn't involve the semaphore, so it doesn't need to be held. So holding a semaphore for an overly long time is another common problem. And then another problem is releasing the semaphore more times than actually needed. So here we acquire the semaphore and then we do multiple releases and that'll keep incrementing the count by one, which may cause problems if that resource is not actually intended to be accessible concurrently by that many simultaneous threads. Sometimes calling multiple releases is perfectly fine. Other times it's a bug. So you have to be very careful in how you reason about your program in order to use these kinds of locking mechanisms correctly. Okay, so that is basically the end of the semaphore discussion. And uh, hopefully that was, that was useful for you. Uh, what I'm going to do now is take some questions and then we'll talk about the first programming assignment. So question one, uh, I think we talked about this before. What happens if two permits are required and there's only one available? Well, what'll happen in that case is if you call the version of acquire that takes multiple uh, that, that takes account of the number of permits that you want, then in that particular case, acquire will not return until you get both permits. Conversely, if you were to call the acquire method that only will need to get a single permit, then if you call that twice and there are one permit available, it will return for the first time, but not the second. It'll block on the second attempt to acquire it. If a thread blocks on semaphore acquire, is it busy waiting? No, blocking or more specifically sleeping on the semaphore uh, is not busy waiting. So that's not an issue. If I have a semaphore initialized with a negative number, how can some be released? Well, you just saw an example a few minutes ago when we were talking about semaphores where you can call release multiple times. So you would either call release multiple times or you would call the release method that takes a permit count and you could give a number like three or two or however many times you want to release the semaphore. So that's how you can release a semaphore that happens to be negative. Okay, are there any other questions at this point? All right, so you might keep uh, thinking about questions and we'll take questions at the end. So what we're gonna do at this point is we're now going to go and talk about the first programming assignment. And as you'll see, the first programming assignment uses all these features that we've talked about so far. So let me go ahead and bring up the code, and we will talk about that. Okay, so here is the first programming assignment. I'm going to walk through the skeletons and give you an overall view of what the assignment's about and talk about the various pieces. If you go to my Git uh, lab account or GitHub account, you will find all the files that are shown here. The index.html file basically documents what the assignment is supposed to do. So you can just open it up in your favorite web browser and it'll show up very nicely with all kinds of clickable links for information about various things you'll need to know to do this correctly. I think at this point, we've actually described all the piece parts that you'll need to understand in order to do this assignment. You'll need to understand how to create a Java thread. Uh, you'll have to understand how to synchronize things with synchronized statements. And you'll need to know how to use a semaphore to be able to mediate access of multiple threads to a fixed size number of resources. And I'll talk about what those resources are in a second. Um, so I think we've covered all the topics in the live lectures, but there's also links here to other videos that explain each of the different concepts. So if you need a refresher and you need something more concise, go watch those videos as well. There are also three subfolders underneath the main assignment directory. There's the, the app itself, which is what you'll be implementing. The skeletons, it's called A1 Android app. There's a fun Android Robotium test that you can uh, use in order to run your program automatically and do various things to it. And then there's also another Java, a Java-based regression test, which exercises various features on the, the uh, Palantiri Manager. So effectively what this program does is it, it uh, just for fun, it gives a 
resource manager for accessing Palantiri. Palantiri, for those of you who are uh, Lord of the Rings fans, are the, the magical seeing stones that can be used to communicate between different beings on Middle Earth. And when a, a being wants to communicate, they take out their seeing stone, their palantir, and they gaze into it for some period of time. And so what we're implementing here is basically a little application that shows how to gaze into uh, palantir. And there's only a fixed number of, of palantiri. There's maybe five or six in the whole of Middle Earth. And yet there are, other, there are multiple beings that want to access those palantir. And so what we do in our little program is we have a visual way of having different beings take turns gazing into the available palantiri. And uh, just for sake of argument, let's assume that there's six beings that want to gaze and there are only four palantiri, then only four beings can gaze at a time and the other ones have to wait until the other beings are done gazing and they return the palantiri to the palantiri manager. So that's basically the base, that's basically the overall idea. And so there's a cool little test program written in Android. And it's got a manifest file where it has a couple of activities. Hopefully everybody knows what activities are at this point. If you don't know what an activity is, you probably don't have the prerequisites for the class. So there are two palant there are two different activities. There's a palantiri activity, which is used to set various parameters the user wants to provide, like the number of beings that will gaze and the number of palantiri to share and the number of iterations to run. And then there's also something called the gazing simulation activity. And this is the one that actually goes ahead and runs and visualizes the palantiri that are gazing. And it's a pretty cool little test program because colors change depending on uh, whether you're gazing or waiting or um, idle and all these other kinds of things. So it's a good way to get a visual view of what's happening. In the implementation portion, you'll see that there's a number of subfolders. The overall architecture that we use here to organize the software is called the Model View Presenter Program. Uh, sorry, Model View Presenter Pattern. And let me go ahead real quickly and uh, just show you a few things about Model View Presenter. So we go, let's go over here. And I will share my screen so you can see it. Let's see. There we go. So if you were to go and Google model view presenter, model view presenter, you will find the model view presenter pattern. And here's what it looks like. There's also, by the way, if you were to Google model view presenter, Android, you'd see a bunch of links talking about how the pattern is applied in Android. And there's a bunch of different, there's a bunch of different frameworks out there that use this pattern. It's very, very widely used in Android. And so we're just using it for our purposes for reasons that we'll discuss shortly. So as you can see, there are three basic layers. There's the view layer, and that's the layer that shows events. And they're also uh, it's used to take events from the user. So the the uh, Passive view is what is used to interact visually with the user, either getting events in or displaying events. At the other end of the spec, and, and that's, of course, what's going to be the part that's going to provide the user interface to this program. Then there's something called the presenter, which is sometimes called the supervising controller. And the presenter is responsible for taking events from the user and processing them, and then giving, making requests to something called the model. And the model is actually the part where the data is stored. So the data or the model is really the part that is, is the, are the resources that are being controlled. And the presenter is the part that requests resources from the model and then gets the results of the model updates back and then uses them to display them to the user. So in this particular case, in our particular application, the view layer will be the activities. The model layer will be the Palantiri manager, which is the thing that manages access to the Palantiri. And then the presenter will be the part that actually does all the multi-threading. And it's gonna interact with the view on the one hand, and it'll interact with the model on the other. So uh, this is a little different than the model view controller pattern, which is another 
common pattern that you may hear about. So if you say uh, MVP versus MVC, you'll find a bunch of articles that talk about model view presenter versus model view controller and the differences and so on and so forth. So the main difference is model view controller typically allows multiple uh, views and the model view presenter typically allows a single view at a time. There's some other differences as well, but that's one of the main ones. And that works very well on Android, of course, because there really is only one view at a time, typically. Uh, and that's the current user-facing activity or fragment that's interacting with the user. OK, so that's the overall architecture of the application. Let's now go back over here to the uh, program that we're running. Let's go back over to Emacs and look at the code. All right, so let me share my code here. And of course, well, so so here we go. Here, this is the the MVP uh, pattern. I'm sorry, this is the MVP design of our program. And uh, as you'll see, our application has several activities. It has the Palantiri activity, and this is all provided for you. This is really just there to prompt the user for various types of input. Uh, in this particular case, we're interested in knowing things like uh, how many beings do they want, how many Palantiri do they want, how many iterations do they want to run. That's the kind of thing that this particular activity does. And then when you're all finished with that, you hit a button that says Start Simulation, and Start Simulation will then go ahead and um, get an intent to the gazing simulation activity. And then it turns around and it starts an activity to run that intent. So the Palantiri activity is only there really to get user input. And then it turns around and launches another activity to do the work. And this particular technique is a, something I do very commonly in my programs. Uh, you'll see this occurring over and over and over again in the stuff that we do where we have factory methods that go ahead and take input and then return an intent that can be used to launch another activity. So this particular activity is, is pretty, pretty in, uh, not very interesting. It just is there to get input from the user. More interesting activity, which is also provided for you, is called the gazing simulation activity. Let me go ahead and make my screen a little bigger here. So this particular activity plays the role of the view in the model view presenter pattern. And it uses something called the generic activity framework. And I'll talk more about this framework at a later date. We don't have time today to go into it in detail. And you don't really need to understand it in detail to, to do, the, uh, do, the, do the assignment. But basically what we do here is we create something called a generic activity. And the generic activity, which is defined over here in the common class or common folder is basically a way of being able to coordinate interactions between the view layer and the presenter layer in the model view presenter pattern. And we'll come back and talk more about that later. Again, you don't need to know how that works in order to use it. So basically what we have here is the code that actually runs the user interface. This code, again, is all given to you. I will outline it briefly, but you don't really have to understand it in full uh, blown detail in order to be able to run this application. So we have an intent, which is the action gazing simulation intent. And we have a list view, which is the uh, palantiri list view. And we have the being list view. If, if you run the application, you'll see that we have uh, little dots for the number of beings and little dots for the number of, of uh, palantiri. And we can control the color of those dots using these array adapters to change their color to based on what state they're in. We have a button that's used to start or stop the simulation. We have a bunch of default parameters that can be overridden. By default, you have six beings, four palantiri, and you gaze for five iterations. Here's the factory method that takes the parameters and then goes ahead and creates an intent. And we put the number of beings, the number of palantiri, and the number of iterations as extras into the intent. And that allows the caller to be able to use that information and pass it along. Here's the onCreate method that's called when this activity is launched. You can see it 
calls up to its super class as always, sets the content view, which is described in the resources file, and then it calls up to a uh, method that's defined in the generic activity framework. And this method, which again, we'll talk about in more detail later, is really cool. It goes ahead and it creates an instance of the presenter layer, and it stores that instance of the presenter layer in a retained fragment, which means that if your activity is destroyed because you rotate the screen, the state of the palantiri with all the threads that are running remains unaffected. So that's the basic idea here. We're trying to make it easy to preserve the state as the application is, is uh, rotated, the activity is rotated. And you'll see that later when we talk in more detail about Android concurrency, that this is very, very useful to simplify concurrent issues that otherwise arise if you have activities that are created and destroyed dynamically. You then go ahead and initialize the views, which are the, the various ways of visualizing the palantiri and the beings. And then the final thing we do is we go ahead and run the simulation. And we keep track of whether or not a configuration change has occurred via the presenter. And we do that so that we don't have to worry about the state um, outliving the lifetime of the activity. This is not the only way to do this, by the way. You could use the set retained instance hooks as well, but this is a little bit cleaner to my mind. Initialize views just goes ahead and initializes the Palantir list view and the being list view and the simulation button. Go ahead and initialize a couple of adapters, which have the colors that we need for the various dots. We set all those things up. Now, when the simulation is run, when the run simulation button is clicked, we first go and check to see whether or not the presenter layer and the threads in the presenter layer are currently running or not. And based on various things, that'll affect the behavior of this, this button press. So if nothing is running and the configuration hasn't changed, that means we're starting for the first time. So we tell the presenter to start, to start running, or we, we set the running flag of the presenter to true. We set the simulation button to say stop simulation because that's what we want to do after we start running so you can stop a running simulation. And then we go ahead and start the simulation in the presenter layer. We'll look at that later. That goes ahead and launches all the threads. And that's the code you'll have to write. If a configuration change is occurring and the simulation is already running, then we simply don't do anything. We just say we're continuing the simulation. We print out a toast that says the simulation is continuing. And finally, if if the if a configuration change uh, or the simulus, if the um, everything is shut down, then we're going to turn around and say start simulation. So this will occur when everything is stopped and we rotate the screen. Here's the simulation button pressed method. It basically checks to see whether things are running or not, and it does the right thing, either shutting down the presenter layer or running the simulation with a value of false. Now there's also a whole pile of methods here that are used to are used by the presenter layer to update the view layer. These are the things that the presenter is going to do in background threads. These these methods will be called from background threads. So here's a method called show beings, and this goes ahead and it creates a runnable, and it then goes ahead and will. Um, modify the beings to make them all be yellow, which means that they're they're idle. And then it updates the being adapter to display that. And then it goes ahead and will uh, check to see if the method is running on the UI thread. If so, it invokes it directly. Otherwise, it calls run on UI thread. And uh, actually, you know, I think I don't think I need to have this check. I think I can just do that. So let's change that code because run on UI thread figures out whether it's on the UI thread or not. This, by the way, is an example of the Hammer framework. And we'll talk more about the Hammer framework later. That's one of the concurrency mechanisms that Java provides. We can run on UI thread. And then here's how to show the Palantiri. We can do the same thing down here. We can just go ahead and call run on UI thread. And that will go ahead and do the right thing, whether it's being called from the background or the foreground. There's another method called mark palantiri, which we use to change the color of a palantiri at a given index. So the, they're indexed 0 through n minus 1, where n is the number of palantiri. So we can set the colors here. We can make a new runnable. 
set the color appropriately, update the adapter to change the display, and then we can run that on the UI thread. Notice that the key thing here is that we always want to run, uh, we always want to run UI operations on the user interface thread. And most of the time, these methods are being called by threads that are running in background threads. And so those threads, the background threads, cannot directly access the uh, display. And so we have to use the hammer framework to reroute the runnable to run in the context of the UI thread. Here's how we can set the bean color to the right color. And then there's also a bunch of things we do where we uh, have methods like mark free, mark unused, mark gazing, and so on. And all these things do is they call those other helper methods to set the colors to the right color. So these are just changing the colors of the dots. When you run the program, you'll see how that works. You'll see how it all behaves. Mark waiting, mark gazing, and so on. When we're done, when the uh, program decides we're finished, we go ahead and set things to gray and yellow, which are their default colors, pop up a toast to say the simulation is complete, and then we go ahead and set the presenter layer to not be running, and then set the simulation button to say start simulation, so it'll start all over again. And we go ahead and run that on the UI thread. When you shut things down, uh, and you typically shut down, typically when an exception occurred or the stop button was pressed, it goes ahead and pops up a toast to indicate that. And when a thread shuts down, uh, it goes ahead and indicates a few things to change the colors and so on to uh, indicate that the, the being that was running in that thread is now going to be idle. That's the bulk of the behavior in the presenter layer. Um, there's also this other piece here. This is the dot array adapter. I'm not going to talk about this in detail. This is really just the thing that sets the colors of the dots correctly. All right, so that, that's all code that you get out of the box. You don't have to change any of that code at all. Let's now take a look at the code that you actually have to modify. As you can see here, there's a couple of different parts. The main part is something called the Palantiri Presenter. And this is the piece of code that implements the the presenter layer in the model view presenter pattern. And again, we'll talk more about these things later. You don't need to understand them in great detail to do the assignment. This keeps track of all the state that will outlive any changes to the gazing simulation activity. So the gazing simulation activity may come and go, but all the state here will not be affected. So we keep track of whether a configuration change has occurred. We keep a weak reference back to the view layer. Keep a list of being threads. We'll talk about those later. You have to manage that list. There's also something that's used to keep track of the number of gazing threads. It's an atomic long, so it'll be incremented and decremented atomically. We keep track of whether we're running or not. We keep track of the colors of the palantiri and the colors of the beings. That's actually shared with, with the, uh, the, the view layer. Then we have a, a constructor that's a no-op constructor. We need that for the generic activity framework to instantiate an instance of this class. The onCreate method, when an instance is created and uh, initialized in the view layer, this will go ahead and initialize the model layer. It'll also create an intent that's based on the, the intent passed from the view layer. This is the one that's used uh, to start the activity. We parse the contents of that intent to set things like the number of beings and the number of iterations. And then we indicate that a runtime configuration change has not yet occurred. So that's provided for you. Whenever you rotate the phone, the on configuration change hook method is called back. And that simply updates the view weak reference and then indicates a configuration change has occurred. And when you're all done, the on destroy method gets called and that destroys the model layer as well. Here are some helper methods. Configuration change occurred, just keeps track of whether a configuration change occurred. Here's a factory method that takes the intent and creates an argv list that will be using the various parameters that are passed in as extras to the intent. This indicates the number of being threads, the number of palantiri, and the number of iterations to gaze. Other helper methods is running, returns true if the presenter layer's threads are running. Set running can be used to set this to true or false to decide whether you want to run or not. These keep track of the, these are accessor methods to keep track of the colors of the palantiri and the beings. Here's the start method. This is the one that gets called by the, the view layer to start things off or to restart things after rotations have occurred. 
So as you can see here, what this does is this goes ahead and it initializes the Palantiri um, manager. So initializes the Palantiri manager, which is in the model layer. Creates a atomic long with an initial count of zero. Shows the beings on the user interface. Shows the Palantiri on the user interface. And notice that we're accessing the view by using the weak reference. And this is done, of course, to ensure that, that uh, garbage collection takes place, place properly. We then go ahead and start the being threads for the number of beings that were passed as a parameter. And you'll have to write this code. And then you go ahead and wait for the being threads. So this will spawn n threads, one for every being that gazes. And this will wait for all the being threads. And so we'll take, let's take a look at those two methods next. These are the two main methods you have to actually implement in this program. And this, of course, illustrates the use of Java threads. So the begin being threads creates an empty array list, which you can see is uh, defined earlier to be called M being threads. You'll then create a new being thread for every being in the being count. And that being thread has to perform the being runnable logic. We'll take a look at how that works. That being thread gets added to the array list. And then you go ahead and iterate through that array list and call start on all the threads, all the being threads in that list. The, uh, and, and so that's the code you'll have to write. That's the code that involves starting, creating and starting threads. Then the wait for being threads method will start another Java thread that will wait for all the being threads to finish. And of course, it'll do that by calling join. So it'll use the join method to do the barrier synchronization. And then after all the threads have been joined, it will then call mview.get.done to inform the view layer that the simulation is completed. And the reason why this has to run in its own thread is that in, in Android, you can't have the main thread, the UI thread, blocked for an extended period of time. So we have to spawn a separate thread to, to wait for all the other threads to finish. If something goes wrong, then the shutdown method gets called. And we'll see where that gets called. And that goes ahead and shuts down all the being threads and then indicates the view layer that a shutdown has occurred. So it can change the status of the, the simulation button from uh, running from uh, stop simulation to start simulation. OK, so that's the main thing you have to implement in the presenter layer, these two methods. Let's take a quick look at being runnable and being thread. Being thread is simply a subclass of thread. And it's got some cool stuff in it that makes it easy to go ahead and shut down the uh, running threads. And it does that by simply setting a volatile Boolean called M shutdown, which is defined as a static volatile. And it sets that to true. And then we'll see in a second, the gazing loops of all the being threads will periodically check to see if they've been shut down. And if they're shut down, they go ahead and close out. So that's being thread. We just need that in order to make it easy to shut things down. Here's being runnable. Being runnable is the class that implements the being logic. So being runnable implements runnable. It keeps track of the index of the being, which of the beings it's going to be, being 0, being 1, being 2, et cetera. Keeps reference back to the enclosing palantiri presenter. The constructor sets those fields. And here's the run method. This, this whole class is largely the run method. And the run method will go ahead and uh, figure out the underlying being thread, which it uses for various uh, diagnostic information. Then it goes into a loop. And it loops for i equals 0 to i equals um, 1 less than the number of gazing iterations. Every time through the loop, it'll first check to see if it's been shut down or not. If it has been shut down, then it goes ahead and, and tells the, the view layer it's shut down. And then what it does is it goes ahead and it updates the view layer to say, I'm about to start waiting. And then it goes ahead and acquires a Palantir from the Palantir manager. So this call will block if there are no Palantir that are available. So we'll acquire the Palantir right here. This will block until there's one available, or it may return right away if there is one available right away. And do a little sanity check to make sure we haven't gotten too many of these things that are Palantir Manager is working properly. Then mark this thing as being in use on the screen. The being, uh, sorry, the Palantir is in use. 
we mark the the uh, being as gazing, so those colors will change. We then go ahead and gaze at the palantir for uh, a random amount of time. If you look at the palantir class, you'll see that gaze gazes for a random amount of time. After gaze returns, we indicate we're no longer gazing. We note that the palantir is no longer in use, so it's free, and we decrement the gazing count. And so we keep doing this over and over again for the number of times we're going to gaze. And then when we're done, if an exception occurs, we send a shutdown message to the view. And no matter what we do, we always go ahead and return the Palantir back to the Palantir manager. So we're releasing it. And notice the full bracketing in this logic. This is fully bracketed. So the thread that acquires the Palantir is the same thread that releases it. After this loop has run for the allotted number of times, then it goes ahead and will exit. And that will allow the presenter layer to join with it because it'll be gone. Here's increment, gazing count, and check. This simply uses the atomic long to increment the count of gazing threads by one. And then we just do a sanity check to make sure that that hasn't gotten too high. And if it has gotten too high, we, we shut things down with an error. And decrement gazing count just decrements the count by one. So those are the various things that, that are available in the presenter layer. The only one that really matters that you have to really understand how to implement is Palantiri Presenter. And both those methods are fairly short. The tricky part, of course, is to figure out how to call the other pieces. But it's pretty straightforward. Finally, we have the model layer. This is where all the interesting uh, access to the Palantir, Palantir are controlled. Here's what a palantir is. A palantir is basically an interface that being threads can use to gaze. It plays the role of a command in the command pattern. We have a, uh, we have a palantir ID. We have a random number generator. These things are initialized in the constructor. And when gaze is called, we sleep for a random amount of time between one and five seconds. And uh, you can also get the ID, and you can also check to see whether a palantir is equal, and it has a hash code. This is for being able to do comparisons with different uh, palantir. Here's the palantir model. This is what is called by the presenter layer. This particular class has an instance of something called the palantir manager. That's what you're going to have to implement. On create doesn't do anything. On destroy doesn't do anything. Make palantir, which is the code I gave you as the factory method, goes ahead and creates a list of palantiri that's going to be as big as you request. So you can basically, I guess we could actually put uh, the palantiri count here if we wanted to. And uh, we then go ahead and we'll create a random number generator. We'll create a new palantir for every one of the palantir count that we've got. And we'll add that to the list of palantiri. And then we go ahead and we create a new palantiri manager passing in the list of palantiri as the Palantir instances we're going to manage by the Palantir manager. There are a couple of methods that are called by the presenter layer, acquire Palantir and release Palantir, and those simply forward to the Palantir manager. Here's the Palantir manager. You can see that so far, all the code has been given to you. Let's go now take a quick look at the code that you have to write. Here's the Palantir manager. As you can see, it has a semaphore and a hash map. So the semaphore is just what we talked about. Uh, hash map is basically a simple Java data structure that's used to associate keys with values. In this case, the key will be the palantir, and the value will be a Boolean that keeps track of whether the key is currently available or whether it's in use. And you'll see how that gets used in a second. Here's the palantir manager. So this is what's going to be used to initialize those data structures. So you'll make a new hash map. You'll iterate through the list of palantiri that were created as the, uh, passed in as the parameters. And for each palantir in the palantiri list, you will go ahead and put it into the hash map. So you'll put the palantir into the hash map with the value true to indicate it's available. And then when you're done, you'll go ahead and initialize the semaphore to be a fair implementation that will mediate concurrent access to the given number of palantiri. So the number of palantiri will be, of course, the, 
the number of palantiri in the list. So that'll be the, the count of the semaphore. So what that means is if you have, say, four palantiri, you'll have a semaphore with a count of four, which means up to four concurrent beings can simultaneously gaze at the palantir. Then you go ahead and write the acquire method. So the other methods are acquire and release. And these methods basically are going to show how to use semaphores and synchronized statements. So, so this is the part of the, the uh, earlier discussion that we talked about. So um, acquire has to acquire the semaphore uninterruptedly, which might block, of course, if it has a count that's zero or less. And after it's gotten a semaphore, it then has to iterate through the hash map in a thread safe manner. That's the key thing. You have to use a synchronized statement to find which of the keys in the hash map is true, which means it's available for use. And then you go ahead and replace the value of this key with false to indicate the palantir is no longer available. And then you go ahead and return that palantir key back to the client. So that's what acquire does. And release will basically take the palantir, do a sanity check to make sure it's not a null, null uh, reference, and then it'll go ahead and it will uh, put that palantir back into the hash map, setting it to true again to indicate that it is no longer um, in use because it's been released. And of course, at that point, uh, you'll also have to do all of this code in a thread safe way using a synchronized block. And when you're done, then you'll also release the semaphore. So if everything goes well, you release the semaphore to indicate that the palantir has been put back into the into the map correctly. OK, and then there's also a, a helper method that I show that just returns the available permits count, which is used by the it's used by the uh, Java test program, the JUnit test program. OK, so that's basically the implementation. Um, as I mentioned before, there's also a bunch of other cool stuff over here. We will come back and talk about these things later. You don't have to really understand them in order to do the program. And you also don't have to understand this really cool file called the mvp.java file. Uh, I'll also explain that later. What mvp.java does is it defines the interfaces between the different layers in the model view presenter pattern to restrict what can actually be seen by the different layers in the pattern. So we'll talk more about that later. That is also not necessary to understand to do this correctly. So to recap, you have to implement two methods in Palantiri Presenter to create threads and start them and wait for them. So that's the thread part of the program using what we learned in the first couple of lectures. And then you also have to implement the Palantiri Manager. You have to implement three methods, the constructor, acquire, and release. And those methods, of course, uh, will illustrate the use of synchronized statements and also semaphores. So that's basically what you're going to have to do in order to implement this program. OK. So let's go ahead and, and take any questions that people have about the programming assignment or anything else that's on your mind. So uh, one question is, can I use a fragment as a view layer? So what a better way to put that is you would typically use fragments in your view layer. Um, so usually, of course, even fragments need to be associated with activities. So your, your view layer is a com composition of activities and or fragments that work together to provide the visualization for the user. So yes, you can certainly use fragments in the, uh, in the view layer. Another good question, what is a weak reference and why is it being used? So this is something that uh, we'll cover later in the course, but I'll give you a, a quick recap right now. So a weak reference in Java is basically something along the lines of a, of a smart pointer. And it's used in order to be able to ensure that the object that holds, that de defines a weak reference that holds a reference to something else is not going to preclude the use of garbage collection when that thing goes away. If you're familiar with Java, you know that in Java, only objects that have no active references can be garbage collected. And so if you use strong references, which is the opposite of a weak reference, then if you pass 
a reference from one layer to another. Like let's say we pass a reference from the view layer to the presenter layer. If you use strong references, which is the default, then that means that the activities in the view layer cannot be correctly garbage collected as long as there's a strong reference to them held in the presenter layer. Now that would be a very bad thing. And why would that be a bad thing? Because in Android, as we'll discover later next week when we start talking about some of the quirks of Android, uh, you'll discover that in Android, whenever you rotate the phone, that causes the current activity to be destroyed and a new activity to be created to handle the different layout, the different view layout, configuration as it's called. And so if you had the presenter layer holding a strong reference back to the activity in the view layer, that activity could not be cleaned up properly. And that would cause all kinds of problems. So uh, not the least of which would be your, you would have uh, excessive memory utilization that would cause your program eventually to run out of storage, which would be bad. There are other problems as well. So instead of doing that, we have the presenter layer hold a weak reference to the view layer. And the weak reference doesn't count as a strong reference, so that allows the activity to be correctly garbage collected when the screen is rotated. Now, what that means, of course, is that the presenter has got to be updated with respect to the view it's holding when a screen rotation occurs. And that is what the generic activity framework is doing, among other things. The generic activity framework is keeping track of these configuration changes. And when a configuration change occurs, it's automatically calling back into the presenter layer, passing it the new reference to the view layer that's actually going to be used by the presenter layer in order to invoke methods defined by the view layer. Now, that may all sound a little bit uh, mysterious at first. And, and don't worry, we will cover this in more detail later. But uh, it's actually extremely powerful and uh, very easy to use once you understand the basic uh, idioms of Java. These are really Java programming idioms. And you understand how the model view presenter pattern organizes these relationships in order to make it easier to uh, rotate screens without breaking anything in the business logic of the application. Uh, if you didn't have the model view presenter pattern implementation, this code would be way, way harder to program correctly because you would have to manage the threads and the lifetime of the threads in the main activity, which would just be chaos and insanity. Or you'd have to use fragments directly, which, which also has, um, it's overkill for what we're trying to do here. Um, let's see, we have to use API 22 in Linux. VM is x86, ARM is not supported. Will this be a problem? I don't think so. Um, I don't know why that would be a problem. Um, we, I use, uh, when I run the emulator on uh, my x86 platform, I run it in um, hex M mode. And the nice thing about that is it's way faster, but it's also, of course, using using x86. So I don't think that should be a problem at all. OK. Are there any other questions that anybody has about what we've covered so far? OK. Well, in that case, thanks very much for joining. And I will look forward to talking to you uh, soon. We'll have another, another uh, lecture next Monday. And between now and then, of course, I'll put up the new slides and the new videos, all of which should be available. So go ahead and take a look. And you'll find in the video links on the website that all the videos from yesterday are up. And I will go ahead and, and put, um, put things up there. Oh, let's see. There's one more question. <laughs> um, do we need to learn Java or Android? <laughs> you absolutely need to, use, to learn Java. You already need to have to know Java. You, you can't possibly make any progress in this course without knowing Java. Moreover, we expect that you've already taken the first two MOOCs in the, the mobile cloud computing with Android specialization. So in that particular case, you also need to, uh, you also need, of course, to understand Android with respect to things like activities and so on. So please take a look at the FAC. The FAC has all the information about what the prerequisites are.
and that will tell you exactly what you need to know in order to be able to be successful in this class. Okay, so thanks very much.